started November 9, 2011. I was in my third semester at MIT, and to be honest, things were a little overwhelming. Other than trying to get good grades, running fast for my cross-country team, I hadn't really found what motivated me or what drove me or what I loved. And one night, it was midnight, and I was sitting at my desk, and I had a textbook in front of me with 30 pages of neuroanatomy that I somehow needed to have sucked into my own brain by the next day. Just as I was trying to think about how to even get started, I saw an email pop up from someone in my neuroscience class. Extension on the exam? Nope. Check out Professor Sung's TED Talk, it read. I can remember my cursor hovering over the link to the, the link that my classmate sent me as I tried to decide if I should take a study break before I'd even begun to study or if it was really time to hit the books. Thank goodness I did the irresponsible thing and clicked the link. In his talk, my professor discussed the idea that our personal identity could be encompassed in something called our connectome. So you've all probably seen something similar to this before. It's a network graph, and it reveals connectivity within a system. In the context of Facebook, the little dots here are people, and the lines connect them to their friends. So the connectome that my professor discussed looks something like this, but instead of there being a couple hundred dots, there are 100 billion with 10,000 connections each. That's 100 trillion connections. So I've taken a lot of math classes at MIT, and they've given me some pretty big problems. But when I start to look at this number, I can hardly even begin to parse what it means, let alone look what it might look like. Um, but something else that I've learned in my classes is that when you're faced with a really big problem, it's really important to revert to first principles. There's always a first step to take, a first hurdle to clear. And when the task is mapping the brain, you start with one neuron. And when you want to map every connection in the brain, you have to go beyond the neuron to every branch, and beyond that to a single point on one of those intricate branches where that neuron receives input from something else. So here's how that's done. Meet Bobby of the Lichtman Lab at Harvard. He's holding a disk with incredibly thin slices of brain on it, and we're zooming in 100,000 times until we get to the view where we can see the boundaries of neurons bumping into one another. So this looks pretty cool, but how do you make much sense of what you're seeing? Um, so first of all, you restack those really thin images on top of one another, and you start to see a 3D cube that is a representation of the original brain sample, but in microscopic resolution. To make out a single neuron in this cube, you can fill in one boundary, and then you can fill in the boundary on the next slice. And if you follow all of those slices through the entire cube, you can start to make out the figure of a small piece of a neural branch. And then if you want to see one of those 100 trillion connections, then you can fill in another boundary and find where those two neurons touch each other. So when I first saw that exact same video in my professor's talk, I was blown away. Um, and it was mainly because I had worked at the Genetics Institute in England that fully sequenced the human genome for the first time the summer before. And I remember one day when I was at this institute working away, I walked into the dining hall one day, um, and I saw that they only had potatoes for breakfast. And I was really confused. I walked up to one of the people I was working with, and I was like, hey, where's the oatmeal? Like, what happened to the fruit? Um, and they told me that it was a very big day at the institute, because the day before, a team of scientists had completed the human, or completed the potato genome sequencing for the first time. Um, so if you're a little unimpressed, I was too. Because I, <laughs> I figured they've already finished the entire human genome. What's the big deal about a potatoes? So it turns out the potatoes actually have more genes than humans do, um, which is a little confusing because, no offense to this guy, but aren't we a little bit more complex than potatoes? Um, and so if they have more genes than we do, then all of our complexity, you know, what makes me prefer Skittles to M&Ms, that must be encoded somewhere else. Um, and this mysterious connectome or brain map that my professor was talking about seemed like a really good candidate. After all, there are 100 million more connections in the brain than there are nucleotides in our genetic sequence, and so those must say something about who we are, right? Or I'd like to believe that it does. Um, so the next day, after my neuroanatomy exam, which 
I kind of ended up studying for. Um, I started my quest to get into the lab that was mapping the brain. So MIT has this program called the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program, and you can pretty much like go up to any professor and figure out how you could get involved in their lab's work. So I walked into the room and I saw equations all over the board and diamond knives that were used to slice up the brain. And they took me to something called the Advanced Reconstruction Room. And it was there that I started learning about using this software that you can use to trace through neural branches, just like you saw in that video. So it sounds exciting, right? And I was pumped on day one. But then two weeks later, after I'd been doing the same thing every day, I was getting a little, a little bored, honestly. Um, and I hadn't completed a single neuron even at that point. And, and in my mind, I was like, you know, there are 100 billion of these in the brain. We want to find all these connections. But at the rate of progress that we're going, you know, this is never going to happen. So I wanted to see about how I could get involved in something kind of beyond the tracing in the lab. Um, and my professor was just planning a course called the Connectomics Lab that was just going to be a month long. And I didn't know what it would consist of, but I was like, hey, why not take this and see what else I can work on? So I want to pause the brain story really quickly and talk about the game that kind of took the app store by storm in 2009. So you guys have probably heard of Angry Birds before. Um, and there's this statistic out there that says that collectively around the world, when the game was at its peak, people were playing for 380 years a day. That's 200 billion minutes. And for what? They're throwing birds at pigs. <laughs> What are you doing? So, so what if we could take that time and use it to do something a little more productive, like mapping the brain? Um, so this is actually the question that we addressed. And this is the motivation going into this lab class that I was taking. Um, and that resulted in iWire, a game to map the brain. Um, so in the game, the players online do exactly what I learned in the reconstruction room and what you guys saw in that video earlier. But instead of one person mapping one neural branch at a time. We have 65,000 people in 133 countries around the world who are working on an entire family of cells in the retina. So what you're seeing here um, is a, a playing demo of a really good friend of mine from our lab, Amy, as she's trying to trace her way through this cube. And you may have noticed that she actually started with a seed point, which is the part of the neuron in pink. So that was completed by the artificial intelligence that we've written up in the lab. And so it does part of the tracing. And then Amy is helping kind of spot check the AI and figure out where it missed. Um, so one of the first things that people ask me when I present the game is why eye wire and not brain wire? So it turns out there are actually neurons in the eye um, in a really intricate thin layer of tissue in the back called the retina. And this has been a fascination of neuroscientists for centuries because it has this, these kind of really two different properties that end up coming together to allow us to see the world. And those are um, a diverse array of cell types, but then very specific defined connectivity. And so we wanted to start with the retina on our quest to map the brain, because we all see the world in the same way. We all turn the light that comes into our eyes into an electrical signal using the same types of connections. But once you get to the brain, it becomes a big mess, because you know we, we all have different memories, different thoughts different preferences, the Skittles versus M&M thing, right? Um, and, but, so once we get there, it's all kind of jumbled up. So we wanted to start with something simple and then scale up. Um, and actually, that day is not far away. We have a set of brain tissue in our lab right now of brain tissue that is connected to something called the olfactory bulb. And so that's the area that processes the things we smell. So we have over 1,000 different olfactory receptors. I think this should be a really cool way to start with mapping the brain itself. Um, also because it's, the olfactory bulb is part of the limbic system, which is known to be involved in emotion. Um, and it's right next to the hippocampus, which we know is involved to be in learning and memory. So with mapping this part of the brain, we might be able to start figuring out why, when we smell something, sometimes we get those like, really vivid memories flying back at us. Um, but beyond views for the future, I wanted to talk a little bit about the things that the iWires have enabled our lab to do. So what you're seeing here is a circuit of neurons in the retina that are known to be involved in motion detection. So when I go like this, or when anything else in the world moves up, these neurons fire. 
So we've been able to see them from that perspective, also from this perspective. And the cool thing about being able to see the circuitry in the retina at this kind of resolution is that you can start to imagine a really kind of intricately engineered prosthetic retina. Um, someone whose retina has been breaking down, who's been losing their sense of sight, we could redesign something that could let them see the world in the way that they used to. Um, and this is all enabled by players around the world. There's a guy called Crazy Man on the game, um, and he's a 16-year-old in Bulgaria who spends sometimes 23 hours in a row just helping us with this quest. It's, it's awesome. Um, so we were taking over two weeks to do a single cell, and they can crank one of these out in just over a day. And that is allowing our lab to do some things a little bit beyond just tracing the forms of the cells in the retina. But we were talking about those points of synapse, right? And here what you're seeing is we're zooming in, um, and those little yellow bubbles are filled with neurotransmitter. And you find kind of dense amounts of those at those synaptic points. So we can take the reconstructions that the players make and then really look for those points of synapse. Um, but getting the community to the size that I just told you about was not an instant thing. Um, so we started out, and it was actually pretty frustrating at the beginning because the game was going really slowly. Our algorithms weren't that great, so it took forever to load. And outreach was kind of the buzzword in our lab. So Amy and I one night stayed up till I don't even know what time making way too many neuron cookies just to share the idea of iWire around our department. Um, and at that point, because I was kind of the student in lab, I became the go-to person for outreach to other students into schools. Um, and as a result, just before last summer, the, a program called the MIT Online Science Technology Engineering Community approached me and asked me if I would be willing to write a curriculum for a neuroscience class for one of their high school programs that could pilot in summer 2013. So I said, sure, why not? But why wait till summer 2013? Why not get started now? Um, and they asked me if I already had a job, and I was like, well, yeah, but you know, a curriculum, what is that? Like, a page with a couple things written about neurons on it that students should learn. Not that big of a deal. Um, so it actually kind of turned into like a full-time second job, and because it was really a design process. So not only was I trying to think about what these students should learn, but also I had 24 students across the country who were going into their senior year in high school. So what should they learn? How could I actually make sure they were engaging with it? How could I make sure that they were enjoying it? Um, so what it turned into was, first of all, getting the students engaged with iWire. So I got them all a neuron of their own that they could work on throughout the program and kind of rallied them around a collective cause. And then I also modeled the class after something that I had seen in my own lab. Um, so we had these journal club meetings every week where one lab member would present something that they'd been doing kind of extensive research on. So I had the students each read scientific papers, and then on different weeks, different journal club leaders would meet with me on a Wednesday, and they would present things that really stood out to them in what they were reading about. So we would go through their presentation and kind of pull out what, what they were really interested in and what they could share with their other classmates. And then on the Friday, they would all get together over a Skype or a G+, and they would have their own virtual journal club meeting. Um, and the last part of the curriculum was the publisher of the Connectome book gave a copy of the book to every student in the class. And I asked them each to pick a topic that they really liked from the book. Um, and at the end, they all came to MIT, and they presented their research. And honestly, I didn't know what to expect from that assignment. It was just something for them to do as a final project. But what they did kind of, it, it blew me away. Like, there were 10-page papers that, I mean, I couldn't even understand how they'd picked out these topics. There were things that I had kind of skipped over when I read the book. And it was just kind of this, like, inquiry-driven, project-based learning experience that I'd stumbled upon um, that had allowed me to see what these students were really capable of when they engaged with something that they were excited about. So over the summer, I went from thinking of the students that I worked with from 24 students across the country to really like the individuals in the group. There's Paola, Gustavo, Sarita, people who I'm all still completely in contact with. I went to one of their high schools last week to talk in one of their classes. And I learned that they were all driven by completely different things. So this was um, something that I encountered in a class of mine that I'm taking this semester. And more formally, it's known as the group member mind trade-off. So as you start to think of an individual as being part of a group, you start to give them something that scientists call a group mind. Um, and then that actually detracts from their individual mind. So the more cohesive that a group gets, the less the individual has a mind of their own. 
Um, so in the context of a classroom, a prof professor walks in and sees 700 students waiting to get some information. It's not, you know, 700 individuals. It's a group of people who all are going to take in this information I present to them. Um, but from my own learning experiences, I know that's not true. I sat in that lecture hall, I fell asleep in that lecture hall, checked my Facebook in that <laughs> lecture hall. But I definitely didn't do those things when I was sitting down with one of the software developers at One Laptop Per Child trying to figure out how to configure iWire so that people in developing countries could play the game. Um, that was probably the most I've learned about programming ever. Just I've taken classes, but that experience was huge for me. Um, and so. I started getting really excited about this idea of kind of individuals learning. And in the class that I'm taking, we all have to design a study based on one of the things that we, one of, one of the concepts we encounter. So I've designed a study that looks into not how we attribute group mind or individual mind, but how people act differently when they feel that they've been attributed a mind. So does a student engage with material differently when they enter a 700 person lecture hall than when they enter a small seminar. Um, so that study is actually going on right now, something I'll very much be working on tomorrow. Um, but I think that from my own experience and from the teaching that I've done, there is an effect there. And so I started talking with a friend of mine about this. And we had this like, crazy idea of interacting with students across the whole country. Um, and what better way of doing that than biking? So this summer, we're doing a bike trip from San Francisco to Washington, D.C. And at first, it was just kind of this, this idea that we had. And it's really materialized. So we're working now with Teach for America, um, North Face for our tents, which is really exciting, as of last week, and getting some bikes from a place in Scotland, kind of randomly. Um, and so we're doing this trip. And it's turned from two of us talking about this idea into a pretty big team. So we have seven people from MIT, one from UC Berkeley, one from the, the Netherlands. Um, and then someone from the Mass School of Design, and he actually made that logo for us, which we're really excited about. But, and we're leaving on June 9th from San Francisco. So we're gonna stop at 10 different schools across the country, all teach kind of project-based workshops about our passion. So I'm teaching about mapping the brain, someone else is teaching about tracking the sun. Um, and at the end of every workshop, we're gonna have a kid write down just something they thought about, and throughout the day, build a wall of ideas. And at the end of the day, we're going to have a project development workshop where we pull down ideas and start to think about how we, you could make a project out of one of those. Um, and then for the past six months, we've also been building a mentor network of people around the world who are passionate about what they're working on. And so for the students who'd like to pursue one of the projects, we're going to match them with a mentor and allow them to kind of find those unique inputs that get them excited. Um, so just to finish, I wanted to come back to the brain and zoom in one more time. So we're rushing through this jungle of neurons, and you'll notice that some of them are lighting up. But they're all lighting up at different things. So when I told you that I was sitting at my desk, kind of struggling to figure out where to go, I was kind of like one of those silent neurons. I hadn't found the inputs that really drove me. And then that email came along and totally changed my trajectory. Um, so I found all these things that I love working on, working on this awesome project to map the brain. I found these amazing teammates who I'm crossing the country with this summer. And I wake up every day and I'm excited about what I'm working on. Um, and I think that we can take this idea that individuals are driven by different things to kind of reshape the way that we think about education. Um, so maybe find a way to drive students in, and find their unique inputs so we can find what might, makes them light up. Thank you.